Not one type of conversation, all types of conversation. That's arrow.net, A-R-R-O-E dot net. All right, let's do it. Let's play it forward. These are real people, real stories. Episode number 438 is with Doris Kearns Goodwin. How are you? Well, I'm fantastic. I love talking to you. And this is like our third or fourth time we've been together because I love the way that you bring history forward. Thank you. Well, I'm glad we can do this together. Absolutely. I, 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 you're so important to history right now. And the reason why is because of the woke movement and this cancel culture thing. And, and you, you give us these stories so that we can replant them inside our hearts. I'd like to believe that that is what I can do. I mean, I think if we go back in time and we bring the people who lived before to life, we can see them fully with their limitations in terms of the context of the time they're living in, but also with the way they grew, the way they went beyond their time, what they gave to us as a country, and and what was missing and what needed another president to fill out. So it's like a relay race, I think, in some ways. You know, one president does something and then the next one hopefully goes forward. Sometimes we go backward. But if we can really figure out as if we were watching them and, and feeling their lives, then we can catapult ourselves back into their time and that's when you get layers of history underneath you it's a great thing to do i grew up in the state of montana so theodore roosevelt is a hero to me because we we studied him like lewis and clark and the reason why is because i'll never forget my teacher saying that 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 theodore roosevelt talked to the future he was talking to the future when he did everything that he was doing I mean, you're so right. You know, when he was at the Grand Canyon, he would say, as people were trying to decide whether to develop it, you know, and and get mining out of it, he said, leave it as it is. You know, it is a work of wonder. It needs to be kept for your children and your grandchildren. The same thing when he'd see the sequoia trees. He was just moved by the sight of these old sequoia trees. Don't cut them down for porches. (laughs) You know, there was a sense in which he saw the generations ahead and saved 230 million acres of land as a result of that executive orders and bills that he could get passed and really becomes the father of the conservation movement, which is so important. And I can imagine living in that beautiful world that you grew up in, in that state, you would feel it even more than some people who don't appreciate it as fully. Well, when you start doing the history and you're watching shows such as this on the History Channel, you, you really do start to embrace the, the beauty that has been preserved because of people like, uh, you know, Teddy Roosevelt. That's exactly right. And the great thing about this kind of show that the History Channel is able to produce, which is not only the experts talking about Teddy Roosevelt, but having live action sequences. So you see a Teddy Roosevelt, you see him going to the conservation land. So you see the cinematography that allows you to see the beauty of the country that is being preserved. That's the glory of having a movie like sequence combined with the historical documentary form. It's a kind of a new form that's been developing in these last years, and I, I really think it's a wonderful combination. What you do with this documentary, Doris, is that you create the oh wow moment, because everybody thinks they know American history until they watch this documentary, and they start to realize, I don't know everything. Oh, for sure. I mean, that's true for me. Every time I study a new person and I start out with Abraham Lincoln or Teddy Roosevelt or Franklin or LBJ, I feel like, oh, my God, I didn't know these things about them. And that's the thing. If you start with their early years, which the documentary does, you watch them from the time in Teddy Roosevelt's case when he's a privileged kid, but yet he has asthma and he has to go out of doors to get relief and he develops that love of the outdoors. You watch him going to the state legislature where he's going to make mistakes because he's got a swelled head and he thinks he's all too important and he starts yelling and screaming at his opponents. You watch him learning from that mistake and then you watch him going through all the different parts of his career where he goes from the state legislature out to the Badlands, becomes a cowboy and then comes back as police commissioner of New York and then becomes a rough rider and then comes back to be governor and finally to be vice president and president. So he's got this really winding path that has taken him through all the different parts of America, which allows him to become the leader that he became in many ways, empathy toward different kinds of country parts, different regions, different sections and different people. My God, you, you, you just said the Badlands. And, 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 you know, a lot of people around the world don't understand the Badlands of, of the, the Dakotas and Montana. It's, it's not, you know, they're, they're so known for their mountains, but it's the Badlands where everything goes into the earth, where, where so much has been accomplished. And, and Theodore Roosevelt was, was such a major part of that plan of preserving so many territories out there. 
he often said that if he had to only choose one period of his life to, to live over again, it would be that period of two years when he was in the Badlands. In part, it was because he got enormous solace from nature after the death of his wife. His 23-year-old wife had died in childbirth on the same day and in the same house as his 46-year-old mother, who had come to take care of, of the of the daughter-in-law and he was so depressed by that he thought that his life had come to an end he went out and found that sense of spiritual reward I think mm -hmm. that nature provides plus he was on his horse 15 hours a day so he didn't have time to think he said which allowed him to sleep at night and it became he said he would never have been president had it not been for that experience because suddenly he became a westerner in the minds of many people not just this dude from the east so he was able to knit the east and the west together and become an American president if, if you if you've not been to the Badlands, Doris, you got to go do it. And, and what you have to do is you have to go out there and sit out there uh, at midnight and watch those stars high above you just speak to you. Because he he's right about that. There is something about that part of the world that has a, a type of energy that makes you a leader and not a follower. Yeah, and in fact, he wrote some of the, he wrote 40 books altogether, which is amazing when you think about that in addition to everything else he did. But the best ones really are about his experiences out there. They, they have a lyrical, poetic quality, I think, because it spoke to his soul, just as you suggest. Mm -hmm. So now, what was it about him at 42? I mean, we our, our current president is, is the oldest one ever, but at 42, Teddy Roosevelt becomes the president of the United States. Yeah, and I think partly that's what made him such an interesting figure to so many people because the presidents before had been much older and much more staid than Teddy Roosevelt was. So he gets into the White House and he's got young kids and they bring their animals into the White House. They have a goat that comes into the White House. They have lizards. They're walking around on stilts. They have roller skating along the halls. And people feel a sense of, oh, my God, there's life and energy. There's youth in the White House. So it was a new generation coming into power at the turn of the 20th century century. Interestingly, much like John Kennedy, a century later, coming in in 1960, um, bringing that new generation, and, and again, being the other youngest one beside Teddy Roosevelt. And he had that curiosity and a sense of excitement about life and fun. And people felt that he was a fun celebrity president, unlike any they had really seen in, in a long period of time. I I know we've talked a lot about Maybe American. Ever. You're right. You're so true about that. The uh, we've talked a lot about American history and stuff like that. But there's going to be listeners and people that study history. Do you put focus on the on the the Panama Canal because he was a huge part of that as well? Certainly, that's a part of it. I mean, he understood the importance of having that Panama Canal for America's ability to yep. become a global power. And he was able to figure out a way to get involved in this Panamanian revolution so that Panama, he exported them, made them a nation, and then in return got the chance to build on their property. And, um, and he really oversaw the construction of that thing as well. He considered that one of his great accomplishments among, among so many other things. I, I can't thank you enough for this. And, and once again, it's because I'm from the state of Montana and Teddy Roosevelt is a hero in my life. Please continue to do, to do these kinds of stories because we need you in order to keep us moving forward. Well, thank you very much. I do believe that it gives us solace to look back at times that were difficult and see that we got through them as we did the turn of the 20th century with greater strength. It will give us a certain kind of comfort in our own difficult time right now to look back at this time. Oh, I love where your heart is. You be brilliant today, okay? <laughs> thank you. I will try. <laughs>